Greetings from beautiful Vienna, Austria. This episode will be in two parts, and I'm so fucking excited to share this with you. I'm traveling in Europe for most of the summer, most of it with my beloved spouse meister, Georg Friedrich Haas, for his work, but also for me. I have started teaching again, and I'm so thrilled, and I'm so excited to be doing it all over Europe. So I have some gigs here in Vienna, and then in the UK, and Scotland, etc., so I had the delight and pleasure of being able to record a class that I did this evening at the Vienna Art Institute. I was invited there because they have a very strong program of inviting artists to come and speak on all sorts of topics. And as an artist who speaks about sex and alternative sexuality and race, gender issues, I was so delighted to be their guest. So I am bringing you tonight part one of that lecture. And then part two will follow next week. For those of you who are Patreon folks, you will also receive an additional bonus episode this week, which is basically me and the amazing Sarah Ablinger, who is someone that I met while I was attending and working on Barbara Corellis's Urban Tantra retreats. And we've been friends ever since. And she was so instrumental in getting me in connection with the folks here in Vienna who were doing this work. So thank you, Sarah. You are an amazing, gorgeous angel. Without any further ado or a don't, here's part one of the Vienna Lecture. This is Melina Lee Williams Haas. I deeply appreciate you listening and taking the time to hang out with me. I will be addressing issues of life, the universe, and everything that are often bogged down and mired in shame and grief, and talk about how they can be repackaged to be useful and gorgeous and fucking awesome for you. So sit back and relax, or you know what? Sit up and freak out. However, you prefer to listen. Let's go. I have the honors of introducing Melina to you. Melina is a teacher of mine, uh, a very great New York based um, sex educator, <laughs> artist, Miss Leather, has so much in her repertoire that I can talk about her for <laughs> hours probably, and she does too. <laughs> that is true. Uh, yeah, you will listen to her stories in a, in a few minutes. Um, I'm so happy you're here tonight. Thank you. Thank you for a big round of applause because Sarah single-handedly made this happen. It's, it's from my end. I came to her and I was like, I'm going to be in Europe. I'm doing some help me find things and stuff. And so extra round of applause because that was really fantastic. Mm -hmm. So um, we met actually, we found out eight years ago. Yeah, it's which quite is quite a long time. Um, um, at the Urban Town for Professionals training where you were a teacher of mine, mm -hmm. teaching us about sex, um, racism in the sex positive <laughs> community, which was, again, one of these, so many things I've done about teaching were accidental. Um, I want to say first and foremost, if at any point I use a word you don't know, or I use a phrase that you're like, what the fuck is that American bullshit? Please just wave your hand. Um, my, my beloved owner slash husband, who I refer to as a spouse meister, since he is my master and my husband, um, is also Austrian. And so I am used to dealing with you people. <laughs> um, but I'm also aware that my, my, my primary goal is communication. And if you're sitting there swimming in doubt because I used a word or a phrase that you didn't know, I would much rather have you just raise your hand and say, what the fuck does that mean? Um, than sitting there un not understanding or not comprehending. Um, all I want is for you to understand what I say. So do me a favor, please. If I say something that you don't get, let me know. Is that cool? Great, thank you. And I will thank you for it because I appreciate the opportunity to be heard and understood. So thank you. And if you have a question, just raise your hand and I come running with the microphone. Yes. I am recording this so that I have a record of it. If you want to ask a question and you don't want to be recorded, just let me know to cut the mic and I will stop it. 
So let's get started. Yay! Tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got <laughs> into the... So here's the like yeah, microwave nice. version of why I'm a pervert, because people are always like, what happened to you? How did you get here? I will say first, I've always been a weirdo. I started reading when I was about three years old, and my parents didn't think I could actually read. They thought I was just pretending. And when I was about five years old, they caught me pretending to read a copy of The Joy of Sex. And my cousin actually caught me first, and she said, I think it's fine that you're reading this, but I have to tell your mom. Because, and I was like, please don't tell my mother. Because even then I understood that I had done something that was not quite right. And my mother freaked out. My mother is very conservative, very Christian, very religious. She has relaxed a little bit in the intervening five decades. But at the time, she was very upset that her baby daughter was looking at pictures of dicks and assholes and pussies and all these things that should not be discussed until you are an adult. Now, nowadays, we know that that's too fucking late. But at the time, you know, this is the early 70s. My mom gave birth to me when she was just barely 20 years old. So she tried her best, and I did my best to disobey every single piece of advice she gave me about sex. And so when I started being curious about sex and sexuality, I was very into it. And when I met my first boyfriend at age 15, we did all the freaky stuff. He was very Catholic, and so he had told me he was going to wait until he was married to have sex. And I said, I've been waiting to have sex since I was five years old. I'm not waiting until I get married because I don't even know if I'm going to marry you. But I found out that apparently if you have anal sex, it's not considered violating the, the, the religion of the church. So I got fucked up the ass for like six months before I had, you know, Christian sex. <laughs> and my first boyfriend and I actually had another partner, my best girlfriend, who I had a crush on. She and I were both dating him for a while. It was very Prince and the Revolution, Wendy and Lisa at the time. This was the 80s. That was just how it was. I discovered in retrospect that what we did was actually rather mature because we negotiated our relationship and we had agreements about what was and was not okay. And the reason our relationship ended was because they were making out without telling me first. And I was like, I hate this, but we agreed that we would either all be together or we would all discuss it beforehand. So sadly, we have to not have this relationship anymore. And then when I tell this to like old, like polyamory perverts, they're like, you did that when you were 15. I'm like, yeah, bitch, I figured it out. <laughs> so my exposure to alternative sexuality has been throughout my life. Growing up in New York City, you see a lot. A lot of life happens on the streets. And so I knew about queerness. I knew about gayness. I knew about uh, gender fluidity. I knew about all of these things just because I saw it on the streets of New York. Growing up in the 70s especially, there were parts of town where you knew the sex workers were trans folks, and people sought that out. And in retrospect, it might seem really horrible and really sort of shocking, but the reality was at the time, folks were de deciding their own fate sexually. That revolution had just begun. You know, Stonewall had just happened. Um, actually, I think two months after I was born, Two months, yeah, I think it was two months after I was born. Um, so I grew up in that environment of possibility. And I learned from a very young age about consent and about negotiating. And it just was logical to me to talk about what you wanted. And so when I discovered that this was not normal, I started freaking out. Like, if you are on a first date with someone and you say, hi, nice to meet you, are you interested in marriage and children? They were like, what do we get? I just met you. I'm like, yeah, but I'm not going to waste my time with you if you don't want that at all. And then when I came into the kink and leather communities and realized that those kinds of conversations were not just sort of um, uh, 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 normal, they were necessary. It was seen as a very necessary part of your kink and leather journey to know what you wanted and to be able to articulate it and to be able to get someone to say yes, you know? Um, 
my sexual liberation then grew into a pervert liberation when I was about 23. And I met a very nice British boy who, uh, he had an accent and I have a weakness. You know, I just, it's, it's a problem. <laughs> And uh, at the time, the accent weakness for the British accent was especially lethal. I've moved on and I've like put the Irish accent above the British accent right now. But that's okay. We don't need to tell the British people that yet. Um, so I met this guy. And the first time we hooked up, he basically threw me up against a wall and like leaned in with this incredibly sexy voice and said, you've been a very bad girl. Do you know what happens to bad little girls? And I was like, uh, yes, no. Um, <laughs> I was like, I don't know. Maybe you should show me what happens. <laughs> and so to this day, the sound of someone unbuckling a belt and that sound of the leather slipping out of the belt loops, very hot. What I discovered that evening was that sexual brutality was very erotic for me. But Melina, you ask, how did you negotiate that scene? Well, we certainly did not sit down and talk about it. So I'm about to veer into the very controversial aspect of consent. There are various types of consent. I very strongly believe myself personally that discussion and enthusiastic consent that you meet sober, eye to eye, sitting at a table talking about it is awesome but also someone throwing you up against a wall and asking a question is a type of consent, right? Had I said, no, don't touch me, he would have absolutely stopped. And I did ask him this later. We actually had this conversation. And I said, I think it's really weird that you just threw me up against a wall. And he said, yeah, but that wasn't the first thing I did. And I thought about the whole evening. I thought about the fact that, for example, may I touch you? At one point during dinner, he reached in and did this and kind of pulled the back of my hair a little bit. And I just melted because I was just like, oh, well. <laughs> he took note of that and said, OK, she seems to like that. What else can I do? And so we negotiated that first interaction non-verbally in a lot of ways, right? It was a lot of interaction. It was a lot of exchange of energy and feeling and emotion. And that was my foray into it. Now. When I teach about consent and negotiation, I tell people, you can do that if you are ready to risk going to jail. Because the reality is that type of negotiation is extremely dangerous because not everyone reads body language the same way. There's some people for whom reading body language, reading um, eye contact is very difficult. Not everyone has that skill set and not everyone gives off signals clearly. Right. I have brutal, really oftentimes crippling social anxiety and you would never know it because I'm very good at masking that um, because I have been a performer and an actor since I was five and a half years old. It was my job to walk into a room full of white men and convince them to give me a job. And so my skill set there in reading people, in getting a sense of what's happening is extremely high. That is not the case, for example, for my beloved owner. He is terrible. He is terrible at reading signals. And so we spent the first couple of years when we were together with me going, oh, sir. And going, no, calm, come back, calm down. <laughs> um, because he trusted me and knew that I was able to do this, and this was not something he was so good at. So, so much of my development has been about my interacting with other people, with my partners, with other people in the scene. And I very much encourage folks, since I really want to make sure that we discuss consent in various aspects of how consent is obtained and what consent means, that we acknowledge that for some people, obtaining consent is not going to happen in the way that it happens for someone else. Does that make sense? So checking in with yourself, for example, figuring out what the best way is for you to negotiate what the best way is for you to move through the world, what the best way is for you to explain your sexuality to someone else is going to be really critical and vital. So I always tell people the first consensual exchange you have to have is with yourself. You have to give yourself permission. You have to understand what you want. 
Because if you don't, you're going to be floundering around like a fish pulled out of a lake if you don't know what the fuck you want first. Yeah. So that's a little sort of bit about my history and my thing with the stuff. Anyone have any questions, thoughts, feelings? Anyone really pissed off right now? <laughs> Already? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> So I'm, I'm thinking about how we go from here um, to the topic of today, like the intersectionality of mm. consent, mm -hmm. race, and mm -hmm. kink, and yeah. also what all these beautiful artists can take away from your life experience. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because through the sort of lens of consent, I started thinking about what it means to me personally, and then what it means in the aspect of being in community, right? Not everyone who does kink and SM wants to be in community, right? There's some people who do not want to go to play parties, who do not want to be seen in public doing stuff. Sometimes it's just because they're shy. Sometimes it's because it might be a career issue if someone finds out that you're doing freaky shit. I don't know about, um, about here, but I know in the U.S. I have at least... 18 to 20 people I know personally who have had negative impacts on their job because they were outed. And I'm, I'm, does that happen here? I mean, probably, right? <laughs> probably, yeah. Um, and probably people aren't talking about it. So part of the thing that I, when I first came into the scene is that I had to give myself consent to be out. And at the time I was working a corporate job. I was working for Wells Fargo Bank. And that does not necessarily seem like a place where you want to be like, I'm a pervert. Banking, it's like possibly the most conservative outside of a church. It's like churches, money. I mean, they're inextricably linked as well, but that's a whole other class. But what was interesting to me is that the more I talked about wanting to just be out, people in the scene were saying, don't, no, 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 no. You want to use a fake name. This was the first thing. Don't use a real name. I'm like, why? What if I want people to know who I am and find me? They're like, well, tell them later. I'm like, I'm just going to be Molina. This is a pain in my ass. And what was interesting to me was that the first time I was outed was an accident. Well, not an accident, really. I was doing a show called 69 Stories, One Pervert's Tale. And it was a solo show about how I became a pervert because I was tired of having to tell the story over and over again. I was like, just come to my play. <laughs> and it was reviewed in the San Francisco Chronicle newspaper. And so one of my coworkers walks in on Monday morning, slams down the newspaper and is like, why didn't you tell us you were in a show? And I said, did you read the article about the show? That's why I didn't fucking tell you. <laughs> I was like, I don't know if you want to come to work on Monday after seeing my titties and my naked ass on stage and then have to like come up to me and go, hey, can you file this report? Thanks. <laughs> but as it turned out, about 20 people from my job came to see my show. They booked a group of tickets. There they are all sitting. And I'm like, hey, hey, nice to see you. The lesson I learned from that is that everyone's a fucking pervert. There are no, vanilla is not a thing. It does not exist. Because over the next month, almost every person who came to see the show came up to my cubicle at some point when no one was around and would be like, hey, so that thing you were talking about with the spanking, my wife and I love to do that. <laughs> I was like, see, you're a pervert. They're like, no, 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 I'm not a pervert. I'm like, yes, you are, you're a pervert. You have taken something that is meant for reproduction and you've made pleasure out of it. That is perversion by the dictionary definition. <laughs> and he's like, oh, yeah. But you know what's amazing? When you give people permission to be freaky, they love it. Because he assumed, they assumed that they had to go out and have whips and chains and corsets and heels and all this other shit. I said, you don't need any of that. The best scenes I have done in my life, the ones that remain with me, it was not the toy I remember. It was the psychological connection. It was the journey. It was the experience, not the whip. Right? And so giving people permission to say, hey, I'm a pervert too. Yeah, I'm a freak. I'm a weirdo. I like freaky stuff was amazingly liberating for so many people. And so just me sort of going, hey, you can be a pervert too, sitting in your own home. <laughs> was a revelation for so many folks. 
And again, this is about getting that consent, giving yourself the permission to be who you really actually are. And then once you are living in that truly authentic space, getting that consent, obtaining that container where you can be who you are becomes easier because you are not in your own way. Do you know what I mean? We tend to put ourselves in our own way when we're afraid. And there's a lot to fear when you're putting yourself out there as someone who is sexually non-standard. There's a fear of judgment. There's a fear that people aren't going to accept who you are. And that fear is very real. But what I have found, and this is my own personal belief, is that the people who reject you and freak out and prosecute and push and abuse you are doing so because they're afraid. Because they fear, maybe they don't want that, but there's something that they don't have because they're afraid. And if you can let go of that fear, you find so much richness in obtaining what you need. And so I try to approach people who are very oppressive with compassion and say, I'm so sorry, you are not getting your genitals treated in the right way, because that's probably what's going on here. <laughs> I'm sorry that you are not able to reach out to your partner and say, this is what I need. Because it's very scary for a lot of people. I mean, I don't, I, I, I'm probably one of the older people in this room. And I can tell you, I've seen entire relationships burn to the ground because people failed to say, this is what I need. I've seen marriages. I have friends who have been married for longer than I have been alive who wanted to talk to me about how they reconcile a gap in their relationship because they had different needs. And I was like, how are you possibly asking me? You have been married for 50 something years. And they were like, but you have a way to say the things. And I was like, okay, let me try to say the thing. But what's amazing about that is that that's so human, isn't it? To be so afraid to say, this is who I am and this is what I need. And the thing about consent culture, which I am, you know, one of these cranky Gen X people who's realizing that the cranky boomers actually like are cranky for a reason <laughs> because society moves, things change and shift. And the consent culture that is coming up is oftentimes for a lot of us a little bit stressful. We're like, why do I have to go through all of that? Well, you have to go through all of that because the end result is so much more satisfying when everyone is on the same page and everyone knows what is desired of them. And everyone knows exactly what they need, right? And, and I'm not saying this from a place of perfection. I've been with my partner for, it'll be 10 years this fall. And it was just last year that I said to him, look, you know what? I just, this is going to sound really weird, but can we? And then I spewed out this, like what I thought was this outrageous, ridiculous kind of fucked up evening that I had planned. And he was like, absolutely. And I was like, that's it. <laughs> I was like, could you be more shocked? <laughs> Cause I was just like, I thought that if I said I wanted to watch tentacle porn and eat pie while you eat my ass was going to be a lot. And he was like, do we even have pie? <laughs> like that was his question. Like, is there pie? <laughs> And I was like, yes, sir, I wouldn't have said it if there wasn't I. <laughs> but my reluctance, my shyness, my embarrassment about loving tentacle porn kept me from even saying this to like the person I love and trust the most. Because I hadn't given myself permission yet. So I'm saying this to encourage you, not because it gets easier after, I mean, I've been doing this for 28 years consciously. It doesn't get easier. So I'm not saying like you were just going to be this expert at consent and spewing out what you want and owning your desires. It's going to be hard. But the reward is pie, tentacle sex, and ass eating. I don't think that sounds bad to many people. Like pick one of those things if you don't like all three at the same time. It's a bit intense. <laughs> But one of the, I just, I can't say it enough. Please love your freakiness. Please give yourself permission to be a goddamn weirdo. Do you know how I met Georg Friedrich? On OkCupid, which is a stupid fucking dating site. It's not even designed for perverts. I took my pervert profile and slapped it on the fucking regular ass vanilla website. 
and got dozens and dozens of men who were like, oh my God, you do that? I want to do that. And I was like, yes, but I want you to do that to me. There's so many submissive men who are just like, please step on my fucking balls. And I was like, oh, I'd gladly step on your balls because I just happen to like that, but not daily. But then I met my beloved other person, right? Like through this stupid site where like you think that putting out there that you're a pervert and a weirdo is going to make you vulnerable. And it does, but it makes you vulnerable in the best way, which is you are saying, this is who the fuck I am. And that is so vital and so critical. And once you have done it, you are inviting into your life and into your energy field other folks who are attracted to that bravery, who are interested in your honesty, who see that you are being who you really are. That is sexy as hell. When people meet someone and go, God, you are really you, that's hot. And anyone who doesn't believe that is a douchebag. <laughs> If anyone believes that they are, this is part of the reason why I always get so pissed off when people are like, oh, training, you have to train slaves and submissive. No, you don't. You have to just be. You have to be. You have to exist. You have to love me how I am. And if you don't, you're not the right owner for me. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Maybe at this point, um, I would like you to talk a bit about the wording you're using because I'm not sure everybody is, is familiar mm -hmm. with the words you're using, like owner and yes, slave and one of the one of the things that I talk about when I talk about um, being involved in kink and BDSM is large. There's different types of consent, right? There's personal consent between yourself and yourself. There's consent between you and someone else, but there's also consent within the room, right? We are all exercising a form of consent right now because no one is sitting here on their cell phone talking out loud. We've all made the agreement that we're in this place. We all know sort of how we're supposed to be here. And we've all agreed to be, you know, listening to me when I speak and, you know, speaking in turn and all that shit. We've got all that down pat. And so there are things that people anticipate and expect in social situations. It can be really difficult when you get involved in kink because now it's a whole new society and you're like, how the hell do I behave here? And one of the things I encourage people to do is to think about consent in terms of your social situation as well. When people are doing scenes that are shared with other people, as in we're in a dungeon space, we're at a party, we're at someone's house, we're all doing kinky shit. One of the things that I encourage folks to do is to make sure that the people around you know what you're doing, especially if you're doing anything that is considered edgy or edge play. Is that the term that translates? Yeah. Anyone not know what edge play means? Everyone knows. Great. Okay. Awesome. So is anyone shy about saying they don't know what edge play means? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yay! You are awesome. Edge play means any type of kink play that is somewhat risky, either psychologically, physically, mentally, emotionally, or spiritually. So, for example, spanking someone's butt is not considered edge play, right? However, doing a scene where you're spanking someone's butt because they've been a bad little boy can be edgy because maybe that person has is a survivor of... Um, physical discipline. So it can be very edgy. So the thing about edge play is it's also very personal because there are going to be some things that are simple and boring for one person and incredibly emotionally dangerous for someone else, right? I was not physically disciplined by my parents. So I had a sexy moment when my new partner took off his belt. If someone had a parent who abused them with a the belt, that's not going to be sexy. And so this is part of the consent culture that we tried to build, especially in the Bay Area, in the San Francisco Bay Area, where I first sort of grew up in kink. So if I were going to be doing a scene that I knew was going to be difficult or, or, or scary or risky or, or, or heavy, I would let the people at the party know. I would say, I'm going to be doing this type of scene. It's going to be kind of intense. So just let folks at the party know that at 8.30, this part of the dungeon, don't go over there if you don't want to hear these particular bad words being said to this particular person, right? Um, and I very strongly believe that this is a great way to build community because then people can feel safer. The double catch to this 
is that as a black person, I was doing edge play and I didn't even know it. I had no idea. I was at a kink event at one point and a white woman came up to me and was like, I saw a race play scene that you did and it was so disturbing and it was so, I wasn't ready. No one told me you were going to be doing this lynching scene and I, I can't believe it. And I'm horrified because I'm very careful about this. And I'm like, how did, I was like, how did that happen? And then I'm listening to her as she's describing the scene. And I said, wait a second. Was the top who I was playing with, the tall, skinny, blonde guy with little round glass? She's like, yes. I said, I'm going to stop you right there. I'm going to stop you right there. That particular individual doesn't do race play. That was my trainer at the time. His name is David. David is so politically correct. He won't even say the phrase, the N word. He won't even say that because it makes him think of the N word. And then he gets so upset because he had pounded into his head by his liberal left-wing communist parents that not only do you not say those words, you don't think about people that way. And so she said, no, but I saw him. I said, no, what you saw was a black woman getting tied up. And then what you did was make that about a lynching. Lynching is the practice of hanging people. It's like a hanging. But lynching specifically targeted African Americans in the um, in the uh, 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 well prior to the exclusion of slavery. But there was a huge rise in it after slavery was repealed as a way to uh, terrorize the African American um, free population. Um, as a rather ugly little point in American history, they used to actually take pictures of dead black people hanging from trees um, and then sell them as souvenir postcards. And people collect them now. They're a collector's item. Um, so she, being the good white woman that she was, was upset that this was being reproduced in a dungeon. And how dare we? And how dare we do this without telling people? And I said, I, I didn't do that. I was just getting tied up by my partner. There wasn't even a rope around my neck, which doesn't necessarily mean it couldn't be a lynching because there's lots of ways to kill someone with rope. But I realized in that moment that who I was was a problem for some people. I could not exist in the same way that a white woman existed in this culture. I can't just be tied up. I'm being lynched. I can't just do a flogging scene. I'm now a runaway slave who's being abused. I ran for, as she mentioned, a, a leather title. We have, you know, you guys have beauty contests here? Is that a thing in Europe? Right? Like, what is yeah, that? Like, very local. Yeah. And stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, We're America, so we have to do it super extra, right? Mm -hmm. So, not only are there beauty contests for, like, you know, mm -hmm. Miss Manhattan, Miss whatever, it goes up to the national level and whatever else. So, of course, leather people are like, we're going to do this too. But the origin of leather contest actually is, is far more interesting, short version of it. During the AIDS crisis, contest became a way to raise money. And so men's gay bars would have like, you know, Mr. Eagle New York, and they would have hot guys and jock straps get up, raise money for people who were sick to get meds for the men who were dying of AIDS. And then this blossomed into a whole subculture. And I ran for Miss San Francisco Leather, and then I was International Miss Leather. And uh, why, why was I talking about this? Oh, my God, middle age. What was I saying? Beauty contest, leather contest with the thing and the stuff. <gasps> I lost my train of thought. Me too. <laughs> um, Welcome to middle age. So leather contests were a thing. We were doing raising money for whatever. Why was I talking about this? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Whew. Take note, because you're all going to be old at some point. Have someone who's listening more carefully than you're speaking. <laughs> And so part of this contest is that you have to do what's called a fantasy. So you have to do a little, a little skit, a little piece of theater to show, like, you know, something about kink. And my fantasy, you can find it on the Internet. Thank God someone recorded it. I came out dressed in this typical sort of exaggerated costume of a slave. Like, have you seen Gone with the Wind? You know, about those old Hollywood movies with, like, the apron and, like, the big fat mammy with the rag on her head. You know, I came out dressed like this in chains. And of course, the whole audience is like, 
especially the black people. <laughs> but my fantasy was this. I came out in the chains with the thing, and the music that was playing was actually an old, it's a, a piece of music called Lift Every Voice and Sing, and it's basically the unofficial anthem of black Americans. And so me in that costume with that music in the chains, people were like, holy shit, what the fuck could possibly happen now? And so I danced around a little bit, did my little interpretive dance shit. And then suddenly I had one hand out. I was like, oh my God. And suddenly I had two hands out. Suddenly I'm like, fuck this thing, fuck that thing. And underneath I had like a latex skirt and like this leopard bra and like sexy stockings. And then everyone in the audience is like, ah. And then at the very last thing, as the final chorus is singing in this beautiful swelling of music, I pick up the shackles and I put them back on like, yeah, fuck you all. This is me. And the audience is like, ah, freaking out. Except for a bunch of older white women who were very stressed that I abused the imagery and did this racist fantasy. And I was like, wow, the point, you didn't just miss it. You weren't even in the same building as the point. The point missed you entirely by blocks. The point was that this was my fantasy about my journey and me taking power of myself. And I realized I can't be understood by everyone, but I can be understood by a great many people. And the closer I am to being who I am, the more other people will see that and understand that they need to be who they are as well. And this is the thing, like some people were very upset. And I said, you know what? You consented to see whatever the fuck we did when you showed up for this contest. That was your consent. And they accused me of a consent violation because I danced around. Ugh. <sighs> Ooh, calming down. Did I cover the, did I talk about the thing sufficiently? Did I answer the question? Uh, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're going into the topic a bit more, but um, I was also like imagining like you talking about the words. I mean, we're. Oh, right, right, there. right. Oh, we moved in. So that was the thing. So we were yeah, yeah. moving into the whole idea of the words master and slave, right? Um, I very rarely actually use those terms. Um, I identify as being owned by my husband. But when I first meet someone and they're like, what is your relationship? I don't say, oh, he's my master. I'm his slave. I do not do that. You know why? Those words are weighty and they punch people in the face. And that is not what I want to do. I want to seduce people into understanding who I am. And so the language I start off with is, you know how back in the day, in like the 50s, you had that traditional housewife thing? That kind of turns me on. And people are like, really? I'm like, yeah, that's weird, isn't it? <laughs> But then I say, have you ever had that like warm, fuzzy feeling when you do something nice for somebody and they just look at you and they go, hey, thanks. And you're just like, hmm. Like, imagine that's your whole life. And then people are like, oh, wait. I'm like, yeah. I get that warm, fuzzy feeling every time I do stuff for my husband. It just really gets me excited and hot and I get tingly and I'm just so happy. When I see him enjoying a meal I have cooked for him, I'm just like, ee! like, you know, like, and people are like, oh, yeah, I kind of, kind of get that. I'm like, great. So now we're one step closer to them understanding me. If I start off with I'm a slave, the gates go down. If I start off with I get turned on feeding him food, ee! <laughs> more people can sort of like slide into that. And so when I talk about seducing understanding from people, that's what I mean. I mean, making it so that people understand the joy and the juiciness of my life. And then once I say, and part of that is also fetishizing the fact that I belong to him. And I've done the therapy. So when people are like, oh, do you think it's because your parents? I'm like, yes. <laughs> That's exactly why. <laughs> That's damage. <laughs> And look at how I made that damage fucking sexy. Look at how I took trauma and made it hot. Look at how I took the fact that I was basically raised from the womb to serve my parents because of their wounds and their injuries 
And I took that and said, you know what? This martyring myself in relationships, this constantly giving and giving and giving until I can't give anymore and then being crumpled up and thrown away like a piece of trash. I'm not going to have that happen. And you know how I have that never happen again is I have relationships where we have agreed to and consented on rules that people then abide by and honor. One of the most important things I learned when I first came into kink was something that my first dominant called the prime directive. And if you're a Star Trek fan, you know what the prime directive is. But it's not that prime directive. It's a different one. And I will say it twice so you can understand it. The, the, the prime directive says the following. It is the slave's primary responsibility to protect the property at all times, including from the master themselves. It is the slave's primary responsibility to protect the property up to and including from the master themselves. So what that means is in my submission, my first job is self-care. Nothing else is to be done until I have made sure that I am functional, online, and feeling good. And if I am not, and I do not tell this to my partner, I am in violation of our agreement which is the only way to get someone who is willing to throw themselves into a moat full of crocodiles to take care of themselves. I said this to my therapist and I was like, consensual BDSM is harm reduction. And she was like, oh my God. <laughs> she was like, oh, that's good. I was like, I know, write it down. <laughs> But this is what I have found for myself, is that our relationship, which is based on first and foremost consent and love, means that I must take care of myself. And if I don't, that is disrespectful to my husband and owner. Wow, nice, right? So if I'm having a shitty day, I'm not allowed to just put my head down and say, I'm just going to do it for sir. Mer. This was so revelatory for me. And this was one of the things I learned in like the first three months I was in real time doing stuff in the scene. And I, I'm grateful for that crazy, crazy dude. <laughs> Our relationship was not long term. It was like, well, it was long term for the scene, I guess, like two, almost two years, which is a long time in kink. It's like dog years, I feel like. Every year in an SM relationship is like a seven year marriage. <laughs> But what was, what was important to me, and I was so glad I learned it, was that I was valuable. So many people assume that being a slave means that you are a piece of garbage in the corner. And I'm like, that's chattel slavery. The word in English is chattel, C-H-A-T-T-E-L. And what that means is uh, property, an item that belongs to you, right? So if I have my luggage, that's my chattel. If I have my horse and my cow, that is my chattel. If I have my horse, my cow, and my slave, that is my chattel. Because in the slavery as it was practiced in America, I would not have been a human being. I was pretty much on par with, and in some cases below, an animal. And I explained to people, that's not what we do. Consent is everything. Consent is the only thing that makes my relationship with my owner healthy. If you take away consent, it is the unhealthiest, grotesque, garbage, risky, dangerous shit ever, ever. But you lay consent on top of it and it's all good. And then you add to that the supporting structure of my job, my first job is to take care of myself. Do you know who told me that that was my first responsibility is taking care of myself before this man? Nobody. Not my mom, not my dad, not anyone in school, not any of my friends, not one other black woman, because we're not taught that. We're taught first and foremost, it's Jesus, then everyone else in our family except for us, and then maybe we, you know, take a shower. That attitude killed my grandmother, and it caused my cousin to lose her foot. 
because she failed to take care of herself, because she believed that her most important duty was to her family, to her children, to everyone else. And yet I'm the selfish, crazy pervert. You know who's taking care of themselves first? I am, because in my consensual master-slave relationship, I have been given the gift of making me the most important thing in my life before even him. That is what my slavery looks like. And that's why I sneak up to the word. Because if I just start with slavery, you have a picture of roots and Kunta Kente and all this crazy shit when it looks more like me going, sir, I need another hat. And him rolling his eyes and going, I like this one. Or me saying, sir, you are absolutely not going to take this other thing. I, I don't want to hear it. We're not doing it. You're not doing it. Stop. Does that look like slavery to many people? No. A lot of people are like, how? They're like, you're so bossy. You're so obnoxious. You're so pushy. You're telling him what to do. How is that slavery? I'm like, it's slavery because that's what he hired me to do. That's my job. And once, the, once he has consented to have me yelling at him to take his medication, to have me pulling him out of social events because he's tired and he needs to sleep, that is what my slavery looks like. It will not look like other people's slavery, but that is what my submission looks like. And for each of us to decide what our kink, what our fetish looks like is not just our responsibility, it is also your delight. How amazing is it to say, I can do whatever I want sexually as long as they say yes. That's amazing. And you know what? You'll find someone for the yes. For all of you who are like, yeah, but I can like, you'll find him. I don't care if what you want is to dress up like Donald Duck and be in an inverted suspension while people throw carrots at you. There will be someone for whom they're just like, oh my God, I have been waiting for so long. <laughs> Whatever you want, there is someone else who either wants that as badly as you do or wants to see the look on your face as that carrot hits you in your fuzzy butt. <laughs> that type of freedom is what you get when you give yourself permission, when you seek out other people and you let them know who you truly are and let them see you. Because once you can do that, then they can say yes from a place of enthusiasm and a place of trust. And you have to trust yourself first. And it's hard. And I mean, believe me, I am a recovering alcoholic. So I lived through years of self-hatred. I hated myself. I thought that I was literally a piece of human garbage who did not deserve to live. I do not feel that way anymore. And a lot of what helped me was realizing that my submission, my service was valuable. When I did not value myself, I at least said, I can at least do this. I gave me a little something, a little piece of hope until I could say, oh my God, bitch, I am fabulous. <laughs> and I got to that point and I'm at that point and that's what I want for everyone. And the best way for you to get that is to live your fucking life. Live it. You don't have a lot of time here. If what you need is to be a weirdo and have people shove five dildos in you at one time in order to get off, fucking do it. Do it now, not right now. <laughs> Super awkward. We don't have this not a good. Yes, please. No, right now. <laughs> yes. So then the yes doesn't count anymore. How do you actually express that? What I say is, um, I, th I modeled this actually a little bit at the beginning when I said I encourage people to, you know, say if they don't know a thing. And then this brave human being was like, I didn't know a thing. And I was like, and what did I do? Did I say, oh, you fucking idiot, dumbass, everyone else knows it. I said, thank you. And what you do when you realize that there's going to be times when you will say no, or in the middle of a scene, there's a no. And it can suck. And you're like, <laughs> What I do is I tell people, say thank you first, even if you don't believe it. 
even if it's a reflex and you're saying it and it's through your teeth and you're furious, say thank you. Because that will take you into a place of saying, okay, why am I saying thank you? Even though I'm so, super disappointed, I'm saying thank you because that person is being honest and trusts me. Anyone here done something sexually that they didn't want to do? Yeah? That's kind of a universal thing. And here's the thing. Stop. Why did we do the thing we didn't want to do? Generally, fear, obligation. Sometimes it's just to please the other person. And I actually have no problem with that, as long as it is consensual. So the first thing I tell people is to say thank you, even if you're disappointed, even if you're angry, whatever it is, say thank you, because what that person has done is to honor the trust that you have and to honor the fact that you are in that moment authentically saying, I cannot. And understand that the no or the stop or the red or whatever might not be about you, right? This is what people think. Like someone has said, no, it's about you. You take it personally. How can you not take it personally? You're the only one there who heard the no, right? But it's not about you. Get this in your head. That no, that red, that stop is not about you. It's about their need in that moment. It's about their safety emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually. And so what they've done is tell you, I need help. I need something from you. I need you to stop so I can figure out what that is. And so approaching it from a place of gratitude allows you to like let the rage and the anger or the disappointment or the sadness or the confusion or whatever become secondary to gratitude because I have done scenes where I pushed through and I did what I thought they wanted and almost inevitably it led to something not great. It led to me walking away feeling not awesome, not feeling respected, not feeling seen, not feeling like a whole person. And so approaching it from a place of gratitude is helpful. The other thing I will say is before you play, say, what happens if you need to stop? What do we do? It's part of negotiation. It's part of that consent to have the, the, um, in school, when you're in school, do you do fire drills where you practice how to evacuate the school when there's a fire? They ring the bell and everyone lines up. Do fire drills for your sex. What happens if? What happens if the condom breaks? What happens if I freak out? What happens if I dissociate? What happens if I you know, um, freak out? Have these discussions because that drill will assist you when the thing actually happens. You know, um, my first dominant, when we first started negotiating our relationship, we negotiated for the end of our relationship. And I was like, what the fuck are you doing? He said, this relationship will end. It will end in one of several ways. You leave, I leave. You die or I die. It's going to end. And I was like, oh, shit, that's true. <laughs> So we had this discussion and it was stalling to me because I said, wow, it doesn't mean that the heartache is any less terrible when the relationship ends, but it means that you have an idea you have in your heart and your mind. Okay, this is what we do now. So you don't have to pull it out of your ass in the moment of sadness and anger or confusion or loss. It's why we have safe words. It's why we have a word that we say in a scene if we're having trouble, right? And so an emotional safe word of something like, no, stop, I can't. And I encourage people, I'm like, talk about what happens if you need to stop the scene, regardless if you're a top or a bottom or whatever. And understand people who are dominant can also safe word and stop scenes, right? A lot of people think about this as coming from the bottom or the submissive because they become overly stimulated or the pain is too much or the psychological intensity is too much. But that also happens for dominance and tops. They also experience stress and they also need to safe word. So I want to encourage you folks who identify on the top side. I see you and this is not often acknowledged. It's stressful for you. I know so many dominants, like when you ask them if they've done scenes that they pushed through because they didn't want to disappoint the bottom. And then they came out feeling a bit like a vending machine for sex because it wasn't really what they wanted. 
you know, and so I want to speak that as well to the dominant and top type people. You also have the right to say, red, stop, I need this. And the bottom are submissive of whoever should say, thank you, because what they have done is trusted you with a very vulnerable moment. And that is to be acknowledged and celebrated and not rejected. You want someone who's in a bad mood with a 10 foot whip behind you? You do not. <laughs> you do not. Did that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. That was an awesome question. <laughs> You've been listening to All That and Mo. Thanks so much for spending your precious, precious time with me today. My podcast is produced by Cody Crabb, theme music by Georg Friedrich Haas, as performed by Marcus Weiss. And I look forward to spending time with you again really soon. Mm-hmm.